I want to um, welcome you and uh, to our yet another series of Women's Health Lunch and Learn. This has been sponsored um, by the really Rowan Medicine, Dr. Brecker and I from the Department of Medicine had decided that we wanted to reach out to the Rowan community to let you know about medical topics and to showcase many of our physicians who you may hear our names, but never really see. So we took a break in December, we're back now. Um, we're gonna have three presentations today, one about geriatric aging and one about medical marijuana. And the people that could introduce themselves best are the speakers. So we're gonna start off with Terry Ginsburg. Take it away, Terry. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see all these faces. I feel like it's the Brady Bunch slides here. Yeah. Um, so I'm Terry Ginsburg. I've been here since, uh, I've been here in about 23 years at Rowan, went to PCQM, did residency did uh, there, did my fellowship at Penn in geriatric, and I've been here for about 23 years in the Department of Geriatric. Um, and it's been a beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful time here. So um, I was asked by Dr. Kaiser Smith to talk about, you know, successful aging. And this is a community talk that I give to a lot of the um, assisted livings and nursing homes. I, I was giving this lecture a lot pre-COVID, and it's nice to have some of you just to spend you know about a half an hour with me to hear some of my techniques and what I teach my geriatric patients about how to live successfully. So um, how do we live to be 100? And we all know our own daily routine, what we do every day. And some of this hopefully will enlighten you and inspire you to you know engage in, in more of a healthier lifestyle, um, especially right now during our COVID epidemic and everything that's going on. We have to be that much more involved in our health, empower ourselves about our medical decision making, understand the medications we're taking, um, and work collaboratively, work collaboratively with your primary care because if you don't empower yourself, um, it, you know your longevity will be impaired, mortality will increase, um, your overall health and well-being will be affected. So next slide, please. So who is this person? Does anyone know? Any takers? Any? Hi, what, Eudora? Jean Claude, next slide, please. I couldn't hear you. Janae Louise Clement, she was the longest living person. She died at age 122. So how did she live so long? Um, her mother lived to age 86. Her father lived to age 94. She was empowered. She was inspired. She um, she rode a bicycle until she was age 100. And again, we can't stress enough, sedentary lifestyles are extremely dangerous as we age. Um, you know, I get my little seven year olds up every morning. One's doing, you know, the elliptical with me. One's doing the treadmill. They know we start our day. We start exercising and then we shower and then we get our day going. So it's kind of a routine. Whatever you need to do to empower yourself. Get yourself bodies in motion are so important. This lovely lady, I'm unfortunately, I mean, she's she smoked her whole life. She quit smoking at age eight, at 119 and she released a rap CD at age 121. So what does she teach me? She inspired me because she was doing things for her to empower herself to, you know, she was, you know, releasing a rap CD. She was exercising. She was, you know, she had good genetics, obviously, um, and that we can, um, we can't forget about our good genetics, but, you know, keeping yourself active in your life, doing whatever you feel, whether it's bicycling, whether it's treadmill, whether it's walking, whether it's, Socializing at a distance, right? In on this COVID epidemic. Next slide, please. So, what is the advantage of living to be 100? Next slide. There's less peer pressure, um, and you just get to enjoy the fruits of your labor with all the working you did your whole life. You can travel. You can, you know, do things. You can learn a new trade. There's so much stuff to continue to learn. We're all life learners. We all went into academic medicine. I consider myself a life learner. I'm always trying to go on different um, uh, Zoom calls to learn about woodworking or cars, things that I don't know anything about, right? So constantly using your brain, using those neurons, engaging yourself. Um, I learn from my children. I learn from my patients. That's one of the reasons I went into geriatrics. I'm always trying to learn new lectures and inspire myself. Next slide, please. Aging, you know, everyone says aging is a, a disease. It occurs at different rates, as we know, among different individuals, different cultural, uh, different cultures. People live longer at different cultures. Again, the me uh, Mediterranean diet, if you see a lot of people 
in the you know Mediterranean areas, they tend to live longer. The olive oil, they eat a lot more fish. They exercise. They keep themselves active. Obviously, as we get older, we have an increased susceptibility to many conditions. Breast cancer increases with aging. Cognitive issues occur potentially, um, and our medical comorbidities can go awry if we do not continue to try to at least stabilize our conditions. And I. I can't stress enough, and you're going to keep on hearing me say exercise, exercise, exercise. It improves your overall health and well-being. Um, and you cannot use the excuse that you work too hard, that you, you know you have kids. We all are very busy clinicians, but you can spend 20 to 30 minutes a day doing some type of um, physical activity. Aging obviously does not generally cause symptoms, and there's a lot of it, it, myths about aging that you know aging people are asexual beings and aging people have cognitive issues. Not every elderly person has cognitive impairment. Maybe we have memory loss as we age, but these are a lot of the myths that we hear and we see in the media. Um, and a lot of our aging patients actually inherently believe these myths. And it's our job as primary care to dispel all these myths. Next slide, please. So the life expectancy, average life expectancy is about 78. Maximal life expectancy is to 120. And we're seeing our patients live longer now with the COVID. I don't know what we'll see in the next two to three years, how that is obviously affected the life expectancy. But again, empowering yourselves, eating a healthy diet every day, engaging those neurons, reading, reading, learning new information every day. Um, and, you know, eating a healthy diet always. And again, engaging in a healthy sexual appetite, whether it's if you're with a partner, whether you're still dating your partner, engaging in any kind of sexual experience. Again, that's all part of your overall health and well being. Next slide, please. So, changes in our life expectancy, and you can just see how, you know, in the Roman Empire, we only lived about to 28 years old, in 1900 to 49 years of age, and then by 2020, about 83. So, we're living longer, but are we living a quality life? That's the key. It doesn't matter. Is it a quality life? So, it's really important with all of my patients, whether they live in the nursing home, it's just a living hospital that you really encourage and you work collaboratively with these patients and say, well, what do you think you can change to improve your overall health and well-being? What are you not doing? You know, is the depression, what, why are you depressed? What are your triggers? Um, how can I work with you? And, you know, I spent a lot of time on health and well-being and, and wellness. Obviously, in my aging patients, I can't take away their CHF. I can't take away the diabetes. But we really work together to try to figure out different avenues and ways to improve and to maintain their quality of life as long as possible. Next slide, please. And then just looking at centenarians in the U.S., now we have, by 2050, we'll have over 600,000. And do we have room for them? And, you know, do they have caretakers? We know people are living longer. How do we keep them independent? Um, you know, our, our patients, there's, you know, right now, obviously, during the COVID epidemic, there's a lot of these facilities aren't even taking patients because if they have COVID, they can't go into facilities. But what are we doing with our aging patients? They're living longer. They're developing osteoporosis. They're having more decline in their overall health and well-being. And are we doing a good a job as primary care? in trying to help these patients live a quality of life. And I, and I think, again, it's, it's, it's a conundrum that we are because we're very busy um, ourselves. Are we taking care of ourselves and modeling that for our patients? That's one of the biggest issues I see. A lot of primary care, especially women out there, postmenopausal women, are we doing what we can? Or are we, are we doing a disservice to our patients? So if you take care of yourself, and I know Dr. Omowemi always says, she goes, if, if my doctors in my practice are not taking care of their mental health, they can't serve our patients. And she always stresses that with us. And it's so important that as female physicians, we keep taking care of ourselves, take ownership of our own, you know, our own comorbidities so that we can be there for our patients and our families and that. So we know people are living longer. How do we empower these patients? And that's one of the biggest things. Next slide, please. So JFK, and I love this slide, we have added years to life. Now we must add life to those years. And I really think you have to keep thinking that, you know, life happens when, when you make plans. I mean, these are quotes that are really important to listen and think about every day. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but we do know that we can take care of ourselves, slow our pace down, slow ourselves down when we eat, slow ourselves down when we think, slow ourselves down sometimes when we're talking to our patients. Um, and I have my routine every day. I mean, there it, that routine never changes. And 
it helps me get through my day and it gets me more invigorated to come to this office every day to see people. Um, but the big thing is, how, how, you know, are we adding life to these years? And we have to do a good job for ourselves and then it will end up hopefully helping our own patients. Next slide, please. So the combination of longer life and less illness is adding life to years, right? As well as years to life. So the longer we instill the exercise, healthy eating, we will avoid hopefully readmissions, hospitalizations. I do, I take care of patients two weeks in the hospital. And again, the biggest issue I will say is obesity, sedentary lifestyles. And that's why, and then obviously family issues, psychosocial issues. But a lot of my patients are obese in the hospital and they're sedentary. And I really believe if we can really work on, if, if you start with those two areas of medicine, hopefully these patients won't continue to come in the hospital. It's the biggest problem, this is obesity. And I think patients don't even look at obesity as a primary diagnosis. And I think we have to really get into their brain and let them know that is another comorbidity that's causing your other problems to go awry over time. So we have to add life. Next slide, please. So what is successful aging? Low probability of disease and disease-related disability. High cognition of physical functioning. We want our patients to engage in their life spiritually, religiously, um, and an active engagement in life. Obviously, it's a little hard right now, given COVID, um, but they can do Zoom calls. I have a lot of my patients who do Zoom aerobics. They do. They have conferences with their 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 uh, priests, their churches, their spirituality. They get involved via Zoom. They talk to their therapists via Zoom. So. We created, we created a platform, which is actually very helpful, and our patients can have some type of socialization um, via these web CTs and Zoom. Again, it does, not, it does not help you that if you're not gonna actually see someone. We're osteopathic physicians, we like to hold someone, we like to hug, we miss that aspect of what's going on in our lives right now. But I think the best we can do is encourage our patients to get involved in various, if they have computers or they can, you know, through their religious affiliations. I know my synagogue, they have shul, they have synagogue and Shabbat, and it's everything through Zoom, and it's helped my mom get through the loss of my dad. Again, it's how do we, what what are the resources we're providing for these patients to at least help them get through their days right now? Um, and, and again, exercising is on demand, it's on Zoom and stuff like that. So I think we have to really provide those resources. Next slide, please. So what are the keys to successful aging? Next slide. So cancer screening. So with our aging practice, obviously after like 74, 75, we are not as, you know, the, the guidelines pretty much said, you know, colonoscopies, cervical, you know, uh, pap smears, we don't really recommend in our patients unless there's a, obviously a, a problem that we see. Um, breast cancer increases with aging. If my patients are functionally active, and they're engaged in life, I still have them get mammograms, but there's a time when you have to look at these patients and say, what's their functionality? What's their cognitive status? Really, what is it gonna do to have a, a test done if it's not gonna, if they're not gonna go through the treatment and should they even go through all the treatment? So, you know, you're really looking at the patient. You're not always looking at the guidelines, but around 74, we pretty much um, kibosh getting a lot of these cancer screening at our aging, aging patients, specifically, obviously, if they have cognitive impairment, that's slowly deteriorating over time. Next slide. And vision and hearing again is so important. A lot of my patients say it's too expensive to get hearing aids. That's one of the biggest problems that I, I noticed, but obviously we're really a proponent of making sure that they're they're not falling. So we do a third, you know, we make sure we send them to for their vision screening and the hearing as well. Next screen. So our patients, about 30% have a prevalence of dementia over 80. Alzheimer's disease is the most common. Again, you know, we're doing Dr. Nagel and his team are actively working on various modalities, blood testing for Alzheimer's. And I know there's a, there's another drug out there that they're trying to get tested for uh, dementia out there right now. Um, again, it's it's getting these patients socialized, and that's the biggest issue right now that we're dealing with is socialization. Um, but we do screen for cognitive issues in our 55 and older population. We start at 55 in this practice. And if you're having any issues with memory, you have to get it assessed and looked at because at least we know we can plan for the future. So we get elder lawyers involved. We have our social worker in our practice who really talks to our patients and says, okay, you're having memory issues. Maybe you need to start looking at who do you want your, to be your power of attorney, uh, your, power, your healthcare power of attorney, your financial healthcare power of attorney. 
And all these things need to be um, evaluated. We don't want to be a society that's a reaction to society. We want to be a prevention society. So again, stress that. Again, it's all empowering your patients. Take control of their disease state. So we screen for dementia. We continue to follow our patients in the outpatient setting in the nursing homes for cognitive issues. Um, and that's what we have to do. How do you improve, or I guess, stabilize cognitive issues? Uh, obviously, most of these cognitive problems like Alzheimer's, frontal lobe, Lewy body, Parkinson's, they deteriorate over time, and Alzheimer's is much more insidious. But again, I'm going back to exercise again. There's been a lot of data that exercise at least keeps these patients at a, at a status quo with their disease state. It's not, again, it's not preventable, and it's not going to slow the deterioration, but exercise is so key for cognitive health. Um, and your overall well, health and well-being, and again, obviously the socialization that we need for these patients, but that's been a problem. Next slide, please. Immunizations, again, I can't stress that enough. All of us should be get all of us after 50 should be getting our Shinkrix vaccine, the two doses, the pneumococcal. It's um, it's this should be changed, but it's the high dose and the low dose, and then the flu vaccine every year and the tetanus, and then Shinkrix should be added to this. The uh, the two doses of the Shinkrix vaccine after 50, and then you're done. Um, and then now we have to add the COVID booster and the COVID vaccine. So um, I would say a majority of my patients in my office are vaccinated. So that's that's been really positive for me. Next slide. Hypertension, again, how do we help our overall, our blood pressure starts to increase and your systolic blood pressure increases with aging. So again, uh, in your 40s and 50s, your blood pressure was fine. Now you're 60, 70, your, your systolic's starting to go up. Again, exercise, low salt, salt diet, Mediterranean. I tell my patients as they age, it has to be a lifestyle change every day. You can have one or two days that you're eating naughty. Now, if they're they if they have multiple cognitive problems and they're frail, okay, enjoy your life. Have your milkshakes, have your Big Macs. But in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, let us take control. Low salt diets, really take care of yourself so that you can live a longer and a better quality of life as you age. Um, you know, I'm really a proponent of that with my children. They eat yogurt, they eat healthy food, no salt. Ne there's never a salt shaker in my house. You know, everything is health, 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 and and learning, learning it. Now they, you know, they'll have the sweets and they'll have some bad food once in a while. But it's really being a proponent of eating fish, eat, having you know avocados every day, having protein. Um, and us and female physicians also, at, we have to eat healthy because it helps us every day for our overall, our our energy level. Um, lower carb diets, everything like that. And that we have to instill in ourselves and that is a lifestyle change. And again, I feel like that helps with my mood, helps with my, um, with my appetite for life and inspires me to eat healthy and it just keeps me going. Next slide, please. Smoking sensation, obviously single most preventable cause of death in the elderly. You know, we try every day for smoking cessation, talking to our patients um, and, uh, the benefit beneficial results at any age. So we keep talking about smoking cessation. Next slide. Exercise. I, I pretty much have pretty much exhausted you guys with hearing that. But again, lowers cholesterol, reduces prevalence of depression, and improves cognitive health overall. Improves your strength because we, you know, obviously with aging we develop sarcopenia, muscle strength decreases with aging. So we have to develop our stamina, build our stamina. Um, and keep our energy level up. So um, really, it's so important to do 30 minutes every day. You can take one day off, I would say, but it should be in the morning if you can. Really early, 6 a.m., 6.30 in the morning, get yourself going. Um, it will it'll help you the whole day. I, I will tell you, I've been doing it for like 20-some years already. Um, it's part of my life, um, and it, it, I really feel like it, it, it's, I don't need to take other meds. I, I really feel like it's helped help me overall. Next slide, please. Osteoporosis screening, one in four women have a hip fracture of their hip, early detection by DEXA screening, um, and it's treatable and preventable. So we have to make sure we're making sure we get our DEXA scans as well. Next slide. Nutrition, low fat, high fiber, adequate calcium in our diets, vitamin supplements. I would say the most important vitamin supplements I tell my patients and myself, vitamin C, vitamin D, a multivitamin, um, and, and uh, if you need to take like a fish oil, uh, the SIPA, but that's prescription. I mean, they're the ones you should be. Most of the vitamins we, we urinate out, honestly, um, but I would really be a proponent of making sure you're taking your vitamin D, your calcium twice a day, um, and getting adequate rest, which is so important. Next slide. Diabetes, about 25% of my patients over 65. Mo a lot of my patients in my practice are on no meds because they're really involved in taking care of their diet. Um, and then we screen for our hemoglobin A1C. And then again, if they're 80 years old and they have multiple comorbidities and their hemoglobin A1C is eight, that's actually okay for them. 
we don't want it to be any lower because of risk of hypoglycemia. So you have to actually look at each patient individually. You don't want to bring a you know a, a 80 year old who's orthostatic and whose risk for falls all the time and and have such tight control on those patients because that would be that would be dangerous for that person. So you kind of look at their age, look at their comorbidities, and then figure out where you want that hemoglobin A1C. Again, as we age, we don't want as tight control as we did when we were younger because you know we masked a lot of the symptoms. Next slide, please. Medications, again, I would say the geriatricians in this group, we are all about de-prescribing. None of us like to give a lot of meds in geriatrics. We always want to decrease the dosages at every office visit in the hospital. I try to de-prescribe our elderly patients with the highest incident of adverse drug side effects. Um, and 25% of the meds we give are unnecessary. So again, dosages can be decreased with aging. Um, is there a need for you know the statin if they're 80 years old or 90 at that point? When are we going to, you know, initiate certain drugs? How about the SSRIs? If their mood's been stabilized over time, do they really need to be on that SSRI? Can we start, start, start uh, excuse me, can we get them a drug holiday? I think drug holiday is so important in the aging population. So the list of 10 or 15 meds, that should not be part of your patient's armamentarium. We need to de-prescribe. Um, and I, I would say that that's important for ourselves as well as our patients. Yep, next slide. Cholesterol screening, again, we do not prescribe statins to all of our patients, even if their levels are a little bit above the level that they should be, again, because of risk of falls, some issues with cognitive issues. And again, it's 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 we there it's more of a preventive med, right? It's not a titive or or um it's not going to treat a symptom. So the question is, do we really need that statin in an 85 or 90 year old? who maybe their life expectancy is less than 10 years, maybe it'll be two or three years. What are we actually doing for that patient? So you have to really look at their overall comorbidity, their ADLs, their IADLs, what are they able to do in life? And, and are, we, are we harming them more by giving them all these preventive meds based on guidelines? And then we're really, are we really looking at the patient? So really hone in on the meds for yourself, for your patients, and let them understand why they're taking each med too, empower them with that. Next slide. Falls, you know, that's my bread and butter of hospitalization. Everyone's coming in with falls. Why are they falling? I mean, it's multifactorial, obviously. Uh, meds, meds, meds are the number one culprit. Again, you know, the SSRIs, the benzos that we're throwing in these patients, the the sleeping agents that we're throwing at these patients. Um, all, you know, so so obviously that you know our patients who are falling. There, a lot of them are sedentary lifestyles, right? A lot of them are obese. A lot of these patients are on many meds and a lot of these patients, um, you know, they don't live in an environment that's conducive to um, a home safety. So, you know, we're really involved in preventing falls because we know as we age, it's, a, it's just a domino effect. They fall, they hip, get a hip fracture, they end up in the nursing home, God forbid they end up getting a PE and then that's it. I mean, so again, I mean, I'm painting such a, a sad, sad picture, but I see this all the time in the hospital and I, I'm sure Dr. Moemi sees it at the nursing home. It's so important to be proactive and be a preventionist. Again, de-prescribing physical activity, losing weight. We're okay with overweight elderly. We actually like overweight elderly. We don't want them to kick hectic, but we don't want them to be obese. So it's like that that fine line on, of what we're doing. And, and they, they can be prevented. Next slide, please. So future research, I know I'm trying to hurry up. I know the next speaker is going to be speaking. Longevity is induced by genetic manipulations. And there's been some human longevity studies. Next slide, please. And they found some link. There was a study they were doing that how do people live past 95? And they did a study on the centenarians who are Ashkenazic Jews, and they recruited them from their offspring in the study. Next slide. And then they asked some questions. They looked at the physical activity. Did they do blood tests on these patients? Next slide. And what they found in the study, how these patients live longer, they had a lower incidence of diabetes, lower incidence of hypertension, the centenarians possessed some type of atherosclerotic protective gene, higher LHDL levels, and the offsprings had both large HDL and LDL particle size. So it was her uh, it was highly heritable based on gender and specific lipoprotein. So that was a really interesting study that Nir Barzali did on why are these people living longer. Next slide. So is plasma HDL protective on cognition? Um, you know, it's all these interesting studies. Why are these people living longer? They did a gene analysis and they found they, these patients who were homozygous for this allele had a significant higher among the centenarians and their offspring. Next slide. 
So the future studies are, you know, protein involved in lipoprotein metabolism. Is there an association with exceptional longevity? Um, and they found it was on region uh, chromosome number four. So there's a lot of this genetic testing they're doing with lipoprotein phenotypes to see is that is there been a link with this associated with patients living longer? Next slide. So cancer in the oldest, oldest, we see that about 42% survive. There's about 45% that delayed and 13% in the oldest, oldest escape it. So how are we escaping cancer as we get older and centenarians and older? Next slide. And so cancer has been the second leading cause of death in the United States, about 1.3 million new cases diagnosed in 2003. And basically the mortality due to cancer has increased up to age 90, then it plateaus and then it declines. So why is it declining after age 90? Next slide. So there was a study again that they were assessing cancer prevalence and a type in a nationwide sample of non um, uh, centenarians and they had 1,143 subjects and most common cancers they were talking about were prostate, colon and breast. And 80 years old was the mean diagnosis for non-skin cancers, next slide. And then they're just showing the prevalence of the cancer types about um, found in the centenarian study. And pancreas was the highest level. Next slide. And basically, non skin cancer is generally delayed in the oldest, oldest, the oldest, oldest delayed the onset of cancer by over a decade. Lung cancer has decreased prevalence between centenarians. And the escapers or the delayers may have some type of genetic advantage when you get to that age. Are there protective genes out there? So future studies need to study genetic and environmental interactions among centenarians versus other age groups. Why are these patients living longer? And then we have 60 and 70 year olds who are not. So what, what do they have that we don't? Next slide. So if centenarians represent a cancer resistant phenotype, these findings support the hypothesis that factors that decrease the risk for cancer might also inhibit aging or vice versa. Next slide. So what are the 10 commandments for successful aging? Keep yourself physically active, maintain an appropriate exercise program. Next slide. Keep active cognitively, participate in intellectually stimulating exercises. Next slide. Keep active socially when this COVID epidemic eventually kind of slows down a little, maintain an active engagement with life. Number four, keep up to date, uh, keep up to date on your immunizations. Next slide. Keep up to date on appropriate cancer screening interventions. Next slide. Adhere to strategies for good nutrition. Next slide. Keep up to date on your screening for osteoporosis, hearing, and vision. Screen for hypertension annually and achieve good blood pressure if your hypertension persists. Smokers should pursue a smoking cessation program. And diabetics should adhere to strategies to achieve good blood uh, glucose control. And we can uh, skip the next slide. Can I skip this one, please? Next one. Yeah, this was just a nut. Um, and then some are the, the daunting societal issues associated with longevity. And this is one of the biggest problems why people don't want to live longer. Depletion of financial resources, delayed retirement. They have to work longer because obviously now inflation going up, com competition for jobs with younger people, increased insurance premiums and healthcare costs, population increase, increased urbanization and global warming, emerging infections, i.e. COVID, and increase in poverty. So again, we have to weigh all this with what, what's going on um, in the world today. Next slide, please. We're not getting older, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, oh, I forgot. So, you know, I can't stress enough that, you know, this is a really trying time for everyone. And every day you should at least try to empower yourself, do stuff that's good for yourself, smile, watch funny TV, exercise, eat healthy. You know, it's a new year again. Um, it's a really hard year. It's a, we've seen a lot of deaths from COVID, but again, try to look at the bright side that again, I, I've seen a lot of people been enjoying seeing relatives from far away on Zoom. So they're reconnecting with so many friends and family that they really haven't given the fact that we can't physically be around each other. So there is some positives. We always have to look with our glass half full. Um, and again, with your patients, with yourself, always think of the bright side in life every day. Always try to wake up with a smile on your face. Um, even when even when times are trying and tough as we are living in today. And I appreciate Dr. Kaiser Smith for having me um, lecture to you guys. I spoke pretty quickly. We can always talk offline if there's any questions. Um, and I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Any questions right now before Dr. Um, the next speaker speaks? 
Okay, we're going to have to hold the questions because okay, no problem. You need to end her time. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone that has a question can certainly send it to us, and we will uh, um, we will facilitate getting it to to Ferry. So our next speaker um, is Andy Ionizelli. She is a, a general internist and nephrologist, and she's going to talk about herself, what she's doing, where she is, and marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not all the same. <laughs> what I'm doing isn't necessarily marijuana. <laughs> what I'm doing with my with my career is um, I I trained at Rowan. Um, I I went to medical school here. I did my internship, residency, and fellowship training here. And I've been really close to Rowan from a volunteer perspective. I'm president of the alumni association, um, which is coming to a close in April. Um, and I've also been a volunteer faculty, but what has changed with regard to my passion for Rowan is that I'm, I'm now a faculty member. And uh, back in August, I took a position with um, one of the newer centers for excellence at Rowan, and that's called Rowan Integrated Special Needs Center, or RISN, R-I-S-N for short, RISN Center. And what we do is we take care of medically complex teenage and adult patients as they age out of the pediatric special needs system of care. A lot of times um, they feel like there isn't anyone there to catch them when they fall out of that environment. And that's what Risen Center is all about. So we see general internal medicine patients as well as specialize in caring for this unique and underserved population um, of special needs and, and people with in, um, intellectually and developmentally dis, um, disabled um, people. So that being said, I'm going to talk all about medical marijuana. Brittany, if you can advance to the next slide. And or maybe I'll advance to the next slide. Maybe I can do it. Sorry, Brittany, I, I might have missed. Let's see, I might have missed the cue. I don't know if I'm supposed to advance or if you're advancing. You should be able to, but I can if you want me to. Um, if you can, because I'm having a hard time doing that. I'm technically okay. challenged by the way. Um, so, so, you know, I never 15 years ago, I never thought I would be coming to you all with a, a lecture about medical marijuana. Um, but a few things changed that have enabled me to come to you today with some experience. So unfortunately my, my initial experience with, with medical marijuana was with my son. So our son, um, who's now 23 years old, was diagnosed when he was just getting ready to go into kindergarten with something called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And Lennox-Gastaut is a very refractory form of epilepsy. And so after going through the usual circuit of medications and, and diets, keto diet, having a vagus nerve stimulator, he was not responding as we had hoped. He was still having dozens of seizures, about 40 seizures per month. And so we literally were getting ready to, to rent an apartment out in Colorado because in Colorado, um, marijuana was legal. We were getting ready to rent a, an apartment in Colorado for three months and to go out there and, and try him on marijuana because there had been case reports of people with really severe epilepsy having some relief from their disease with medical marijuana. And so um, this was in um, March of 2014. We saw his neurologist earlier that month and let her know that once the school year was over in June, we were gonna head out to Colorado and uh, and give it a shot and see if we could get some control over these seizures. Because at the time, whenever we hooked him up to a, a brainwave machine, an EEG machine, he was having seizure activity. Even if we couldn't see it clinically, he was he was having the activity. It was there. And so we met with her and she was really encouraging his neurologist to chop. And she said, but hold on. She said, there's. Talk of, of, a, of a medication, a marijuana based medication coming out of England and they are going, they meaning the FDA is going to allow four centers in the United States. To do studies in children with medical marijuana. And CHOP has been chosen as one of those centers, and we're going to be allowed to enroll 25 kids in the study from CHOP. Um, and so each of the neurologists at CHOP has been allowed to give their five most severe candidates um, so that they might 
choose from this pool of, of potential candidates to to embark upon this study. And I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. Fortunately, our son was number two. So I guess the good news is he got chosen for the study. The bad news is he was one of the worst kids at CHOP with regard to epilepsy control that enabled him to embark upon that study. And what we saw is that his seizure counts dropped from about 40 a month down to about 10 a month. And I was like, okay, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm sold and I don't have to move out to Colorado to do it. Um, so he was part of that study um, really for the past for the past seven years. So because I had this great experience with with medical marijuana with my own family, um, you know, my family is, is always my guinea pig. So I try things in my family and then if it works well with them, then I'll take it to my patients. Um, if it's not going to cause them harm. And so then the next population that I had experienced in medical marijuana with was my um, geriatric population. I worked at a place called Med for Lees, which is a continuing care retirement community. And we had a significant number of elderly patients who had pain. They had musculoskeletal pain that was unrelenting. They didn't, for good reason, as Dr. Ginsburg just mentioned, you know, elderly patients tend to, to have more side effects from typical medications. And um, and so we, we had a bunch of patients who had pain, but we didn't wanna use the usual suspects with them when it came to pain, or we tried the usual pain medications and we didn't like their side effects um, whether it made them constipated or dizzy or whatever. Um, and so we started trying medical marijuana with some of those patients for their intractable pain. And we had success in that regard. And now in my position with Risen Center, we have a handful, not a lot of patients, but we have a handful of patients from the special needs population who use medical marijuana. Typically it's for their anxiety symptoms. So I've got you know, experience with regard to epilepsy, with regard to intractable pain, and with regard to anxiety. And I've had relatively favorable results with regard to all of these populations. And so these experiences are really what prompted, um, you know, they, they planted the seed for my passion for medical marijuana. Um, and, and so here we are. Brittany, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about medical marijuana. You know, in New Jersey, it, it's only been approved for about six years in New Jersey for, for medicinal use. And then, as you all know, um, starting last year, it, it was approved, I think, um, by about two thirds to one third in the, the state vote. Um, and now you can use it recreationally. Can't grow your own. It's not legal to grow your own, but it is it is legal to use it um, medically in, in New Jersey as well as recreationally. About 38 states have legalized medical marijuana use. So we can't assume that every state, that it's legal in every state. Um, and then the approved conditions, just to kind of complicate things even more, um, approved conditions vary depending upon the state. So what conditions are approved in New Jersey, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, doesn't mean that those same indications are approved in Vermont. And so um, you really need to know the regulations within your own state. Um, it doesn't mean that you can cross state borders, um, and it doesn't mean that just because um, you know, chronic pain is an approved indication in New Jersey doesn't mean that's an approved indication in other states. Um, now, to complicate things even more, you know, there's, there, there's federal law and then there's state law. So medical marijuana use falls under state law. It is not federally approved. So the FDA approved uh, the FDA has not approved the use for medical marijuana um, in a wide fashion, with the exception of two disorders. And one is Lennox Gastaut syndrome, which is that that difficult to treat form of epilepsy that my son has. And the other is another form of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. Those are the only two approved indications that the FDA has for medical marijuana use. And then to complicate matters even further, it becomes very challenging when we want to study medical marijuana because the federal government sees medical, sees marijuana as a level, I'm sorry, a schedule one drug. And this puts it in the same class as other drugs, such as, you know, the bad, the bad drugs like um, LSD, heroin, <coughs> cocaine, ecstasy, where they're felt to have no medical benefit. 
that makes it difficult to study a drug when it has this labeling from the federal government. However, <clears throat> the FDA we've seen has started to come around and it's becoming more supportive of research, um, which is imperative if we're going to advance um, advance use in, in our population. Next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry, I'm at home with a broken ankle and um, I'm taking my aspirin twice a day so that I don't get a blood clot in my lungs. I'm sure this is not that, but um, my medications that I'm on also cause um, a dry mouth and that's what I think this is. So sorry about that. So how does medical marijuana work? Well. We've all heard the term cannabis. That's like the official Latin term for marijuana. And cannabis has more than 100 active chemicals. So um, it's difficult to study all these active chemicals when it's hard to even do studies in the first place. But we do know that there are chemicals called cannabinoids. And these are actually very similar um, to chemicals that our own body makes. And a lot of times our bodies will make these cannabinoids in response to um, to pain in, in an attempt to stimulate appetite. Um, it actually can help with memory we're finding now, can help with movement, spasticity. So our body makes very similar chemicals to those that are found in cannabis. And um, two main chemicals, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, I'm just going to review them for completion's sake. One is THC, and this is the cannabinoid that actually causes that high. You know, when we think about people a la Chi Chin Chong, for those people who grew up in the um, 70s and 80s, like I did, um, sitting around smoking a joint um, and getting high, that's what THC is. That's the chemical that causes that high. And that's what, for the most part, recreational users are looking for when they use marijuana recreationally. Medicinally, we're typically looking more at CBD, cannabidiol, um, and that's the main chemical that that exerts its effects um, from the therapeutic standpoints that we're going to be talking about today. Now, different plants can be bred, different strains can be bred to have different levels of THC and different levels of CBD. So, for example, the the formulation that my son um, has been on, his is 97% CBD and 7%, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, 97% CBD and 3% THC. And so um, every once in a while, we would think that maybe he got a little bit of a different formulation because he looked like a little bit like he was having that that more recreational type of um, effect. He looked like he was a little bit high every once in a while. He was in a happy place. Um, but my point is you can breed different strains to have different levels of, of CBD and THC. So I think we're going to be finding that, you know, in the next five to 10 years, um, we're really going to be as medicinal use increases. We're going to really be seeing that formulations are bred for specific ailments. Um, next slide, please. Now, how do you take it again? We typically think of it as being smoked because that's what. That's what we know of from the movies and from our friends or family members, perhaps smoking it. Um, and, and certainly that is an effective form of delivery because it, the onset of action is very quick. However, we now know that smoking marijuana, just like smoking um, other forms of tobacco, will, is going to increase the risk of lung problems if done on a chronic basis. So there are other ways, fortunately, <coughs> that we can, um, use medical marijuana. One is we can vape it. And so, again, we're not sure of the long term sequelae of vaping. Not sure if that can cause lung problems down the road. But the nice thing about vaping is that it's also a quick onset of action. And there are also drops you can put under your tongue. That's another um, onset of action that's quite quick. There are other ways where there's a, a slower onset of action applying it to the skin through um, emollients, creams, lotions, even applying oils to the skin, um, you can eat it. Now that's got to go through first pass hepatic metabolism when you ingest it through the GI tract. And so that's going to take longer for us to see an effect. But this is what I use primarily or what I see primarily with my um, special needs population is they'll have gummies, A, because they're palatable for the patients. Um, 
And B, it's, it's like they're getting a snack. So even those difficult autistic kids who might not want to eat anything besides, you know, a, a very specific um, um, types of food groups, they typically will eat gummies. Um, you can do a lollipop, brownies. There really is such thing as marijuana brownies. Um, and uh, also you can ingest pills. Next slide, Brittany. Now, just like any medication in life, there are side effects. This, this isn't a medication um, that is without side effects. And so impaired judgment and coordination, one of the one of the biggest side effects and slower reaction times. So this is why when we're using it um, with someone, it's really imperative to start at a very low dose and then titrate up as needed to get the desired effect because we don't know how someone's going to react initially. So start low and go slow. People can develop dizziness. They can actually have withdrawal symptoms if they've been taking it for a long time and then they suddenly stop. You can get um, some types of withdrawal symptoms just like with any other drug. Um, some people get hallucinations, some cardiac symptoms. Um, some people will feel palpitations or feel like their heart's beating quickly. And then we know that if people use it, whether it's recreationally or medicinally, if they use it while their brain is still developing as a kid, as a teenager, that mental function and IQ further down the road could be impaired. So that's anytime someone's using it before the age of 25. And then there's always that ethical question of, is this indeed a gateway drug um, to an addiction or to heavier drug use in the future? And I think, you know, if you, if you talk to 100 people, um, oftentimes it's, it's divided right down the middle as to whether or not people feel that it's a gateway drug or not. And this is why more studies are really important to, to prove um, this specifically when it comes to medical marijuana. Next slide, please. So, one of the questions I always would get from my patients, not my pediatric patients or my younger patients, but my my um, adult patients is, can I drive? And the answer in a word is absolutely not. Driving under the influence of marijuana, whether it's recreational marijuana or medical marijuana, is still driving under the influence. And so um, just like you wouldn't, you know, have a, a few drinks and drive, you can't just do and it's hard with marijuana, right? Because with, with alcohol, you know, you could have one drink and, you know, you could still drive perhaps with one drink. You can't just do, you know, one, one dose of medical marijuana and drive. No way. No, no way can you drive while you're under the influence of medical marijuana. Next slide, please. Now, this slide, um, it's, it can be found on uh, nj.gov if you just Google NJ.gov medical marijuana, and this whole list is there. And this is a list of approved indications in New Jersey. Remember, I told you every state has different, um, different indications. And so in New Jersey, as of January 12th, 2022, these are the approved indications in New Jersey. And the caveat is it must be a debilitating condition. So, for example, if we um, look at the fourth one down on the left hand column, chronic pain. Um, you know, I just broke my ankle on New Year's Day. Dr. Ginsburg, you would be proud of me. I was out hiking. I was starting the New Year's off in a healthy fashion, trying to get my activity in and it was rainy and muddy and I, I um, slipped on a, a rock and broke my ankle. So I'm going to have chronic pain, at least for the foreseeable future for the next, you know, four to six months. Is this debilitating for me? No, I'm able to come and speak to you. Um, this is not debilitating for me. It's not going to prevent me from working. Um, but approved indications in New Jersey must be debilitating. So you really must have, before we talk about any of these indications, you must have tried other treatments first. Medical marijuana shouldn't be the go-to for any of these indications. So let's just um, take a, a little journey through the indications. Some of them I'll talk about a little bit. Some of them I'm just going to skip over um, and breeze through quickly. Um, and they're in alphabetical order. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Um, I have a, a cousin who just passed away of that a couple of months ago, Bobby Shaney. Uh, I'm not sure if he was on medical marijuana or not, but he certainly would have been a candidate. He was end stage. He was terminal um, anxiety. So, you know, just because someone comes to you and they're like, Doc, I've got anxiety, um, or just because your kid 
can't sleep at night because they've, they've got anxiety doesn't mean that medical marijuana is going to be the go to treatment for them. As I mentioned, you need to try other more conventional treatments first. And, and then if those aren't working and depending on the severity and the degree of the anxiety, then perhaps you're a candidate for medical marijuana, but not everyone with anxiety is a candidate for this. Cancer can't be something like a skin cancer, right? Oh, I've had a basal cell resected. Can I have medical marijuana? No, it's gotta be um, cancer that's more of an end stage or terminal type of, of cancer or a really um, particularly painful type of cancer. Chronic pain, we talked about that a little bit before. Dysmenorrhea, this is a new, a relatively new indication. And by the way, if you looked at this list, even three years ago, up until March of 2019, this list only had six things on it. And then in March of 2019, legislation really um, expanded the approved indications in New Jersey. And it seems like every time I check this list every year or so, there's another indication that's been added. Dysmenorrhea is one of those. So for women, who have really, really horrible menses, horrible pain associated with it, and they've tried everything. Um, medical marijuana may be an indication for them, may be indicated for them. Um, glaucoma, very severe glaucoma will respond, interestingly, to um, medical marijuana. I'm not sure who discovered that, but the evidence is there. Inflammatory bowel disease, and this is not um, irritable bowel syndrome. This is not to be cons confused with IBS. This is Crohn's disease, um, ulcerative colitis, severe types of inflammatory bowel disease respond well to medical marijuana. Any type of skeletal spasticity. So for our patients um, at Risen Center who have cerebral palsy, um, they would be indication, um, they, they would be candidates for medical marijuana. Refractory migraines, multiple sclerosis, that was one of the original indications. Muscular dystrophy, um, opioid use disorder. And some people might say, wait a minute, opioid use disorder is someone who's got a problem with illicit drugs, and you're telling me that this is an approved indication for medical marijuana. Well, sometimes when people are withdrawing from the opioid, um, the, the symptoms are, are really difficult to overcome, and medical marijuana helps with that. People who have HIV and AIDS and stage AIDS, this was one of the original um, approved indications as well. Um, those patients are candidates. People with PTSD, and there were studies done in the military that led to the approval of this indication in New Jersey with soldiers who had um, PTSD from being in battle. They responded well to um, medical marijuana and um, it actually has been quite effective. People with seizure disorders, like my son, we've talked about that already. People who have some type of terminal illness that I haven't already mentioned here who have less than 12 months to live. Again, it can't just be because they wanna get high. There's gotta be some, some indication for it, um, but people with terminal illness generally are approved for medical marijuana and people with Tourette syndrome. That's a newly approved indication as well. Next slide, please. So what do you do? You know, okay, I think I've got a patient who would be a good candidate for medical marijuana, or I've got a family member um, who I think might be a candidate. What do I do? So what you need to do first is talk to um, a doctor uh, who knows you well. It doesn't have to be your primary care doctor. It can be a specialist, but it's got to be a physician who knows you well. And you need to, general rule of thumb is you need to have had a relationship with that professional for at least one year. So they really have to know you well, and they have to know your journey with this process. Um, you must have a qualifying condition in your state, which we just talked about. And then maybe your physician is not registered because you have to be registered to prescribe in New Jersey. So perhaps your physician isn't registered to prescribe. What they would do if they believe that you would qualify, they will send you to a physician for a consultation um, to a physician who is registered in the state of New Jersey, and then you'll meet with that physician. And if that physician agrees, yep, this is a good candidate, then they will help you through the process of applying for a medical marijuana card, which is it's $100 in New Jersey. Um, and then once you get that card, then you can take the prescription that that registered physician gave you. You can take that to the dispensary to purchase your product. Now, important things to know. Number one, none of this, the consultation with the registered physician, 
nor the mar medical marijuana ID card, nor the actual product. None of this is covered by insurance. All of this is out of pocket at this stage of the game. So be prepared for, you know, some docs charge $100 up to I've seen $300. And you can find physicians on the on the nj.gov website of physicians who are registered in the program. Um, if, if you're looking for, for, you know, someone to send patients to, um, but, but just know that patients will have to pay is prepare the patients. They'll have to pay out of pocket for the consult. They'll pay out of pocket for the card, and then they'll have to pay out of pocket um, for the product. So, um, you know, a lot to consider when you're choosing this and Brittany next slide. I think that might be it with regard to my slides. That was it. Okay. Thanks. I thought that was the last one. So. You know, in a nutshell, we have so much more latitude now than we did even 3 years ago in New Jersey. The use of medical marijuana in New Jersey is evolving at a really rapid pace. As I mentioned back um, in from 2016 to 2019, when it was 1st approved, there were only 5 or 6 approved indications. And now you've seen there's a whole myriad of indications that are approved. Um, but it's not without side effects. It's not without financial implications. And it's not without, um, you know, just like with any medication without side effects. So don't think it's going to be um, a magic cure all because it's not. But for people who are at their wits end, who really feel like, oh, my gosh, I don't I, I'm, I'm without hope because I don't know what else I can do. This has given this has been the answer for, for many patients. So that being said, um, I think I don't know if, if you guys want to take. Any questions for Dr. Ginsburg first, if she's still with us, or if anyone has any questions for me? Um, we're happy to entertain questions in the chat if anybody has any. Uh, this is Dr. Brecker. I, I think that Dr. Ginsburg had to go to office hours. Okay. So, um, Dr. Inazelli can take questions if you want to put them in the chat. I'm more than happy to um, go with that. Um, something else I want to add that there are some cannabinoids that are now being used in autoimmune disease and not really for pain relief, but for therapeutics. We, I see uh, one or two that have been used successfully in clinical trials for dermatomyositis to take care of the skin involvement. And also in scleroderma, there's an ongoing study now. Cool. Are you recruiting patients for studies? Are you a are you a PI? Um, I'm a... not doing it right now. There is a dermatologist, um, Dr. Worth, Victoria Worth, who's at University of Pennsylvania, and she's got a couple of this. She does, she's dermato. She does. I'm sorry, she's dermatology, but works in autoimmune disease. So it's mostly it's the skin world that they're doing it. And I can send you some of the abstracts. It's kind of exciting. Thanks. Yeah, really cool to know. So I did get a question um, via text um, of. If I have a card in New Jersey, can I use it in other states? And the answer is no. So you can take your product, like let's say you're going to go on vacation to Florida. You can take your product with you in a lock box, like a little portable lock box. Make sure you take your card with you. Um, so you can transport it across state lines, but let's say you're in Florida and you run out, you cannot use your New Jersey card to get product in Florida. That's that's not an option. Okay, well, we're coming on to one o'clock. I just wanna thank everybody that has participated, especially Dr. Inazelli and Dr. Ginsburg, who gave us some wonderful presentations. And um, we'll be back next month. There will be um, an email sent out about our topic next month. We have two other speakers that are um, signed up to, to work with us and we'll let you all know as soon as um, we have that date. So it's always it's the second Wednesday of every month from 12 to one. So I appreciate all the support and those people that are interested and especially to our speakers. All right, thanks so much. Have a great day.